Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Super glad you're here. Um, I'm just going to be going over Romans 7 today. Romans chapter 7. I did a teaching on Romans 6 and a little bit of chapter 5 about, I don't know, probably maybe two months ago at this point. And I was planning to do uh, Romans 7 and Romans 8 right along with it. Um, but I just, things got busy and I got distracted and I apologize. I should have just done it right away, but didn't get around to it, but now I'm here. I feel led that I'm that I should do it and continue on with the teaching because uh, it's you know you don't have to give up on something just because uh, you know you may have messed up or didn't achieve it. Better late than never, right? And uh, God was actually speaking to me, and I'll just I'll just say this word as I jump in. Um, he just was speaking to me, and he said uh, he said Adam, you know you've come if you've come this far, why give up now? If you have come this far, if I brought you this far through all this stuff, why give up? Why, why be downcast? Why be discouraged? Why throw in the towel? And I just want to say that maybe to somebody who's discouraged. I want to say that to somebody who, who maybe is just feeling really desperate or in a place of desperation right now. God's brought you this far. You've come this far on the journey. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. God has plans. He has good plans. Remember that he has good plans. When you like when you when you run, imagine if you were gonna run a marathon and you ran like oh, what is a marathon? It's like twenty something miles. Imagine you get to the eighteenth mile and it's like you ran this far. You know, you may have tripped a few times, you may have gotten hurt a few times, you may have, you know, not gotten some water or I don't know, whatever. But you got this far. You got to the eighteenth mile. So keep on moving, keep on going. And that's just how I feel right now in my life. Like God's brought you this far. Keep going. Keep going. Never give up. Never give up. Just keep on going. So with that, praise God, I'm going to jump into the Romans teaching on chapter 7. Um, normally I do notes. The last couple teachings that I've been doing, I've decided to do notes. Um, this time I'm just feeling like just opening the Bible. I'm just going to read verse by verse and talk and uh, explain it. Uh, but if you haven't, I would recommend go if go watch that Romans chapter 6 video because Romans chapter 6, chapter 5, 6, and 7, they all really just go right, when you read them all right next to each other, they're really good. So if you haven't gotten a good understanding of Romans chapter 5 and chapter 6, it may cause just a little bit of like confusion potentially if you read Romans 7, but I would, I would just recommend go watch the Romans chapter 6 video. Um, you can find the link to that video in my YouTube profile. So just go ahead and, and uh, like and subscribe to this video and su subscribe to the channel and you can find that video, no problem. But today we're gonna jump into Romans 7. And uh, Romans 7 is a very great chapter. So let's just jump in. And I'll be reading in the NLT, but as we open up, let's just say a prayer real quick. Hey God. Thank you for who you are. We love you. God, we know that you're with us. We know that you're here. Holy Spirit, I ask you to, to move with your anointing, with your power. Lord, as your word ministers to your spirit. God, we love you. I thank you for who you are, God. I pray that you would just show me and the listeners your mercy as we just read through this Romans chapter 7 together. Lord, I, I'd be no better than any man. I, I'd be no different than any man. Even if I can understand the Bible and you can teach using your gift through me. Lord, I learn just as much as the people learn <laughs> that listen to what I say. So God, I thank you that we're all in the same boat and we're all students of Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord. And um, I just pray that you would teach me and teach all the listeners about your word and about who you are, God, and your promises to us and towards us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's just jump in. And let's just start off in Romans 7, verse 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries... The law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, 
she is free from the law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Let's just dive in and uh, let's just examine that a little bit. So first it jumps in where it talks about how the law, it only applies when a person is living. And for example, the example used is marriage. That when a husband and a wife are alive, they're married, the law holds them together. That they are legally bound together by the law. The legal jurisdiction of God holds them together as long as they're alive. That's why it is till death do us part. And unfortunately, in our culture, um, in our society, and all across the world today, we see that marriage is not always valued in that way. That, you know, you can just decide if you feel like you want to be married to somebody or you want to date somebody, and you can just decide when you want to go and when you want to be there rather than making a commitment to somebody. And that's really unhealthy. It's not how God designed it to be. It's not how he made marriage to be, to, to be joining yourself with somebody and then separating yourself with somebody. That is not a healthy way to live. It's not healthy for your heart. It's not healthy for your soul. And that's not what God designed it to be. So he talks about here that the law is something that, that as long as the two people are alive and they're married, it's till death do you part. So the only thing that can separate the couple is the death of the other one. So if, if you're married to somebody, you can't just decide that you want to walk out and step out. You are bound by the law of God to be committed to that marriage. And this is good in the eyes of God. And this is holy and it's the wholesome, it's the right thing to do. But like I said, unfortunately, we live in a culture today where divorce is so common. And so many people are, are growing up with this mindset of that, that's counteractive to the things of God. It's a mindset that is from the world, it's demonic, and it, and it raises us up to believe that we just can do what we want to do and that we're going based on our feelings and going based on our emotions. And here's the thing, the law of marriage that says, hey, this is what you have to do. Let's just, let's, let's, let's paint a scenario here. Imagine you're married to somebody and then things start to get a little bit rocky in the marriage. It starts to get a little bit rocky in the relationship and you're not feeling as happy as maybe you did at one point. You're not feeling as fulfilled as maybe you did at one point, and things are just really a struggle, so it doesn't really feel good to be a part of that marriage. Now, if you're feeling that way, what your feelings are going to tell you to do is start to back away, start to move away, start to separate yourself, and eventually say, you, you'll come to the place where you start making conclusions, this is no longer redeemable. This is no longer fixable. And you put yourself in the position of God and say, this isn't redeemable. It's not restorable. And you say, I'm going to leave. And unfortunately, in our society, that's what happens is people don't feel the same way that they used to feel at one point, And then they decide to leave. And what this reveals is that people's feelings are actually their God. It reveals that that the way people feel is basing how they make decisions. But what we read here in Romans chapter 7 is that while the person is living, the law actually binds 
the husband to the wife. Now, I know that's that's like it's harsh to hear that like that's what it has to be and and when you step out of that you're in sin and you know that's that's hard to hear and it may make your make you a little uncomfortable or you may not agree with that but let me explain something to you in the eyes of grace. So when the Bible gives you a law and gives you a command like hey a husband and a wife should a wife should have one husband a husband should have one wife they should be married and not be with anybody else. None of this open relationship stuff. None of this, well, you know, we'll just try it out. And then, you know, we'll get divorced. Or, or you know, we have too many kids. It's not convenient anymore. It's too hard. Finances. All this and that. There's a million excuses you could have to get a divorce. But the law of God says, no, stay with that person. Do you trust God? Or do you trust yourself? So, the thing about the law is that the fact that you have to stay with that person because God says this is what you have to do and if you don't do it, you're sinning against me. That statement alone, that fact alone, it arouses all sorts of other desires in you that are contrary to the things of God. Why does that happen? I think in my last video I talked about sin and what sin is. How sin is not just doing the wrong thing. But sin is it's actually like an entity, it's a thing that, that comes alive and it's a desire to be hooked on to something that is not godly. Hooked on to something contrary to God, contrary to what is good for you. So when the law is stated that you cannot leave your husband, you cannot leave your wife, that can cause strife and emotion to arise within us because it puts us in a constraint. It puts us in a restriction where we can't just do what our feelings tell us to do. We can't just do what we want to do. We can't just go and leave because we feel uncomfortable. We can't just go and leave because things are hard right now. We've made a commitment before God to this person. So we're going to decide to stick it out and we're going to decide to to follow Jesus and do what he says. So God's law says this to us, but it's contrary to the sin that's living in us. So when we see the law, we see how sinful we actually are. And that's what Romans 7 is going to get into. We see how wrong we actually are before God. And I think marriage is a great example that he used. And I think it's very good that he used it for the times in the culture today, considering where the state of, of marriage is at in the United States and in places across the world. Let's go back to verse 4. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. So, look at, look, listen to this. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce the harvest of good deeds. So we see just in these first couple verses, what the law does is gives us a restriction on what we have to do. But what God's grace does, what Jesus does when we die with him and we choose to make him Lord of our life, what it does is it gives us the life-giving spirit that we are now united with. And because we have this spirit, we can actually produce a harvest of good deeds for God. So now, not according to the law and our own obedience to the law in our own strength and in our own power, but in the life-giving spirit that's united with Christ Jesus, death to the old self, death to us trying to obey the law in our own strength. Now, by God's grace, we can actually carry out and fulfill the things that God calls us to do, which is to stick it out when you're in a marriage. Live laid down as a lover for your wife. Live laid down as a lover for your husband. 
not somebody who's shaky, thinking about your own issues, thinking about your own problems, but thinking about the other. And that is something that you cannot do without God's grace. So when you become united with Jesus, he actually empowers you to be able to do that. And we see that people that are not following Jesus, we see people getting swayed off the road, choosing to get divorced and choosing to to go away from what God is telling them to do. We see that that's an area that grace and love and and their them being united with Christ has not it's not been fulfilled. It's there's there's a revelation, there's something missing, there's a revelation missing, there's a lack of understanding and they chose to go sin. I'm not saying that person can't be forgiven, but what I am saying is that the grace of God is the only thing that can truly empower us in our being united with Christ to actually do the good things that the law says. And marriage is just the example that Paul uses here. So that's why I'm talking so much about marriage. Verse 5 says, When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. So when we serve Jesus, we're no longer just trying to be a good person, trying to do good things, working our way to have acceptance by God. No, we've accepted what Jesus has done on the cross for us. We accepted it as a gift, a free gift that's freely given that I could never earn. And when we've accepted that as a gift, we're dying to ourself. We're dying to all the good things that we do that try and earn God's favor. We're dying to all the things that we try and do to work towards salvation and work for our own our own benefit. And we say, we're dying on the cross with Christ. I'm leaving the sinful man that tries to live in the law, in the power of the law, and produces all these bad things as a result. I'm dying to that, and now I'm going to live with the life-giving spirit, with Jesus Christ, who I can actually freely produce good works for God. So that's what this is saying here. Okay, now we're going to go into verse 7. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kind of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. And we kind of already touched on this when we were talking about marriage. That the fact that God says it is written in the law that you should and must stay with your husband and your wife and be faithful to them. The fact that that is written in that God's law, we see how short humanity actually falls from that. We see how people fall short from that. And this isn't a condemnation thing. This isn't a, oh, you fall short. You've messed up. It's a, hey, look, you have messed up, but there is something called grace that can actually carry you through and that can actually make you come alive so that you can fulfill the things that God calls you to do. But I will say that you will never be able to fully, fully fulfill every single thing that God calls you to do. You're gonna fall short. You're gonna make mistakes. But remember what I said at the beginning of this message? You've come this far. Don't give up. God's brought you this far. You've fallen a hundred times. You just keep getting up. You keep believing in what the cross did for you, not what your performance did for you. And you say, I can get up and I can move on to the next thing. I can move on to the next day. I can move forward in God's grace. Somebody say hallelujah that you are not condemned because you have messed up your last marriage. You are not condemned because of you cheated in your last relationship. You are not condemned because of you disrespecting your husband and things are, are so tense right now and, and things are really hard for you guys. You are not condemned for these things. You are forgiven for all of these things. And when you get that revelation that you are just loved exactly where you are at and you are accepted where you're at, that's when you can your, your soul and your spirit can actually start to live freely in such a way where you start to make decisions not out of fear of trying to please God, but out of, I'm already his son. I'm already loved by him. I just have to exist 
remain in him, remain believing in who he is and what he's done for me. And because of that faith, it's going to produce a harvest of good deeds, righteous deeds towards God. Somebody say amen, hallelujah. That is some great news right there, if you ask me. Because I could look back at many relationships I've had that have failed and that have been broken. But praise God that I live to fight another day and I still hold on to the faith. I fight for the faith. I, f I remain steadfast in God as he has always remained steadfast in who he is. Man, and, and he never changes. So let's go back and talk about what it says here in verse 7. It says, so does that mean that the law is sinful? If it arouses all these sinful things in us, does that mean that the law is bad? No. The law just reveals how perfect God is and how imperfect we are. That's essentially what Paul is saying right here. So let us humble ourselves and let us accept that that is a fact and it's a reality and it's something we need to grasp in order for us to actually walk in freedom and walk Away and walk in a lifestyle that we don't be bound by sin anymore. At one time, verse 9, I think I already read this, whatever. At one time, I lived without understanding the law, but when, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, that the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death. Sin, sin, remember, sin is something that lived in us before we were saved. It's something that, it still lives in us. It lives in our flesh, not in our spirit, but in our flesh. Something that still tries to take advantage of us. It says that sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation. So the law is not the thing that actually condemns you. It's the sin that brings about your condemnation. The law is God's law. It's his perfect order. Sin is the thing that actually has power to bring you to death. And this is what Jesus had to destroy and had to eliminate on the cross when he shed his blood for you so that you could be forgiven. It says now in verse 13, so we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses, God command, it uses God's commandments for its own evil purposes. It's taking something that is so good. It's taking something that is completely pure which is from God. God is not tainted. God is not contaminated. Your mind, my mind, unfortunately, it is contaminated because of sin, because we have all broken God's law. And every single time you've ever sinned, messed up, lived in a way that was not part of how God wanted you to live, you stepped away from God and sin entered your mind and it made a wreck. It wreaked havoc in your mind and it made you think wrong. It made you think wrong about God, wrong about yourself, wrong about others. But the good news of the gospel is that God's grace and his mercy paid for sin by Jesus's punishment, actually absorbing the wrath of God on the cross so that if you have faith in him, you can be justified by faith, not by obeying the law. And that is what is being taught here in Romans chapter 7. But it's interesting how it says it uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So sin, the law is not bad, but sin takes the law, which is a good thing, and arouses those desires in you to break God's law. So God's law is good, but sin takes what is good and uses it against you for its own evil purposes to separate you from God. But God's law is still good. But like I said, the issue is sin. And that's what Paul is about to say here in, as we move on to verse 14. It says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and it is good. The trouble is with me, for I am a human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. 
So somebody say, somebody, you can say hallelujah to that. And here's why. Because when you were living in your past, when you were living in the world, when you were living in sin, in agreement with sin, continuing in sin, you didn't even have a conviction in the world that you thought it was wrong. You didn't even have an urge in you that said, oh, whatever, it's just, it's just what I do. I just smoke. It's just what I do. I just fornicate. It's just, it's just what I do. I just drink and get drunk. And it's just what I do. I do drugs. It's just what I do. I cheat. You know, I just talk about people behind their back. It's just gossip. It's just a little talk. It's, it's not a big deal. Th this was how our mind thinks. This is how sin corrupted our mind so much that we could be doing something that's really harming ourselves, harming God or hurting God, hurting God's heart. It could be harming other people. And we don't even realize it. We choose not to acknowledge it. We choose to turn our face away from it. We choose to think that it's just not that big a deal. It's just how life goes. It's just how it is. And how many of y'all hear that phrase all the time? Oh, life sucks. That's just how it is. That's just how it goes. But guess what? It's not really life that sucks. It's sin that sucks and messed up the life that God gave us. And life without God is a mess. And it's not even true life. But as it talks about here, and as it's going to talk about here, the life comes from living in the Spirit. Which, that's a little uh, hint for when we get into Romans chapter 8. But we see that it's sin is the power that's, 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 work, that's at work here. Let me just read that again. 15. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. This is what I wanted to say. I was talking about how there's areas of sin that you don't even think they're wrong, but Paul is saying here that, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but Paul is saying here that there was, there's, there was areas that you might not even think that you're wrong, but when the law is, is spoken to you, and when you realize that it is wrong, it starts to convict you and it starts to make you feel uncomfortable. That's why a lot of people get uncomfortable when they hear the gospel and that it's wrong to lie. It's wrong to sin. They're guilty. They're a guilty sinner in, in uh, that they deserve the punishment of condemnation, being separated from God in hell for all eternity. That makes people uncomfortable. But why does it make us uncomfortable? Because there's a conviction in our heart that God's law is true and we have gone away from it. We have wronged God. So there's this thing that we have called a conscience. And if we choose to keep pushing away that, oh, it's really not that big a deal and keep pushing God's law away and pushing what is good away, if we keep continuing to do that, our conscience becomes seared and we actually become turned over to our evil desires. God actually takes our desires and turns us over to the things that we choose to do that are not like him. But in the same way, when you come into agreement with God's law that it's good, and when you come into agreement with the things of God that are good and what his word says, what his, his word says, then your conscience starts to get softened again. You start to realize, wow, this is wrong what I'm doing. I need to change. I need to repent. That's God's spirit bringing your soul back to life. That's God's spirit saving you. That's God's spirit working in you to change you. And remember how we read in the beginning where it says that, that, um, that when we obey Christ and when we die with Christ and live with him, that's when we can actually produce a harvest of good deeds. But when we live according to the law, we can only produce the harvest of bad deeds. So God's spirit is the only thing that can really come upon us and truly convict us of the things that we should and shouldn't be doing so that we can actually walk in the way that pleases God and produce good works for him. Somebody say hallelujah for the cross. So now Paul goes on to say, but I know, but he said, but if I know that I'm doing wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. Verse 17 says, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. So now Paul makes a distinction, and this is for the believer. Understand who I'm talking to. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you haven't believed on Jesus and made him your personal Lord and your Savior, you don't have a relationship with him, you haven't been baptized, you're not walking 
following him. You're not his disciple. If that if that's not you, Paul is not talking about you here. He's talking about people who have already accepted Christ, who have declared that he's their Lord and actually believe in him. He says that I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know nothing. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, am I really the one doing wrong? It is sin living in me that does it. Oh, man, there's so much, so much good stuff to unpack. Remember how we said when you come to life with Jesus, now you actually start to produce good deeds. You actually start to produce a harvest of good deeds for God. But when you live according to the law, all that you can produce is a harvest of bad deeds, a harvest of sinful deeds. So it's, so Paul makes the distinction here to kind of drive the point home that when he makes mistakes and falls short, it's not even really him doing it. It's sin living in him. It's something else. It's something that's separate from his identity. I love that Paul does that here in the scripture. He separates his sin, his, 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 the stuff that he, he, he's responsible for it. He, he's responsible that he's done it, but he separates it from his identity. And when you are in Christ, you actually have the authority, you have the legal jurisdiction to separate that sin from who you really are. You can say, that is not my true identity. I am not a porn addict. That is not my true identity. I am not a drug addict. That is not my true identity. I am not a gossip. I am not a slanderer. I am not an, a murderer. I am not uh, somebody who's always angry. You can actually separate those things from your true identity and who you are. Why? It says because you died to the power of the law. You died to all the things that you do wrong and you allowed Christ to take the punishment for you. You accepted that he's the only way. You got baptized. You chose to follow him and said, I do believe that Jesus is the only way. I'm going his way. I'm going the right way. I'm going the good way. And when you did that, Jesus actually put his life-giving spirit into you and changed you in all those those sins that you commit that Paul talks about here, all the sin that's in his flesh, nothing good in him. He says, it's not me doing it, it's sin doing it. All that stuff is on the cross. It's where, it's, it's where Jesus left it. He took it on the cross, he died with it, and it's gone. It is gone. Let me just like, let that sink in. All of your transgressions are gone. Everything that you've ever done wrong against God, it's gone. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. I think I talked about that in my last video. Jesus said to the woman who was caught in adultery, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was going to love her on the cross and go and face death for her. He told her in advance, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. They're out of sight. Your iniquity is covered. Go and sin no more. That's what God calls us to do here in, in Romans chapter 7. Guys, isn't it so beautiful that God's word just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again? And we keep missing it. We keep missing it by trying to do great things by trying to become somebody, make something of ourself, and we miss our whole identity and what the cross actually did for us. That is the only place we can build. Guys, it's the only place that we can build anything. It's at the foundation of the cross that all the work was done. Our forgiveness was bought, bought, paid in full. And Paul because he has this revelation, he's able to even say 
and to take responsibility for the actions he's done, but separate them from his identity because his identity is not in himself. His identity is in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Somebody say hallelujah and receive that today. Somebody just say, I receive my identity. I receive my identity. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I know who I am. <laughs> God is good, guys. All right. Man, if that wasn't good enough, let's keep moving on. Verse 21. Paul says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So when you pass from death to life, when you become born again as a believer and a follower of Christ, you put on a new nature. But there's still a battle that we're fighting. And this is what Paul brings light to in this chapter. That there's a war going on. He says that there's a power that's within me. And it's warring against who I really am. He's saying my true desire is to do right. It's to do good. I want to do what's right. How many, let's just make it personal. I'll make it personal. There is stuff in my life that's happening right now, currently, where I wanted to do the right thing so badly, so badly in a relationship. I wanted with all my heart to do the right thing and to be a, a good, a good man of God and to be a good, caring, loving person of God. And I wanted to remain in complete purity and complete honesty and integrity and have character and exemplify that with the best of my ability, shine like, like I, I have in the past. But there was this power that was still at work within me, warring with everything that it had against my mind, showing me, leading me, trying to get me to just do little things that might compromise, little things that just might mess up. Even things that I may not even have been aware of or had revelation of. And because of that, it caused some strife. It caused some contention in my relationship. And then there was a split. And God knows that it was never my desire to, to, to go out there and make mistakes and make a wreck. But this power of the law, or this power of sin, not the law, it used the law the, the thing that I'm supposed to be doing a good job and upholding the standard of what a Christian is supposed to do. It, the sin, sin deceived me and it got in my head and it messed with my flesh. And there came a point where I, I mean, and I take responsibility that I did mess up and I did fall short in many areas in this relationship. But I can agree here with what Paul says that that's not even really who I am. There's another power at work warring against the things of God, warring against my soul, warring against my warring against my mind. It's warring against my mind. And that's another great thing about this chapter, guys, is Paul makes us aware of that the battle is in the mind. That's where that's where where everything is going on. It's how are you thinking? It's it's your thoughts. The Bible also says that we are supposed to take captive of every thought and make it obedient to Christ. How do we do that? I just want to say, guys, and, and I hope that this convicts you a little bit, but how many thoughts does a person have in a day? Thousands. Thousands. I don't know what it is. There's a number out there. I know you can look it up. But maybe I'll look it up. Actually, I think my computer's off right now. But 
If you have thousands of thoughts in a day, in one day, and you only spend five minutes reading your Bible in a day, and you only spend five minutes praying to God during that day, how on earth do you expect to take every single thought that you have captive? How on earth do you expect to be able to have the strength to live out a godly life and, and actually make every single thought obedient to Christ? Guys, we got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We got to be full. We got to be eating of this word. We got to be drinking of this wine, this new wine, this, this, this wine of forgiveness. It needs to be in our mind constantly. The Bible says to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by the renewal of your mind. And if we're only spending a couple, some of y'all probably only spend like maybe 20 minutes a week in your Bible, spending time with God. Some of y'all maybe only spend a couple, some of y'all maybe only on Sunday when you go to church. That's the only scripture you ever get. That's the only time with God that there really is. But even that, that's just with other people and that's just the gathering. Guys, we're called to have a personal, intimate relationship with God 24-7. And I'm not saying anything that, that you have to be perfect. But guys, I'm going to challenge you to step it up in this next season. And if you spend five minutes with God a day, start spending 30 minutes with God every morning. You're going to see how different your life looks and how different the patterns in your mind start to look. Guys, this, this book... Is everything that we, these are all God's thoughts, man, written down for you. If you want to think like God, man, open up this book and just start reading. It honestly, like, I don't even care where. Open up to the New Testament and just start reading. Just start reading, guys, and keep going until it's been an hour, until it's been two hours. And then get on your face and pray and ask God to reveal it to you. And ask God to make it known to you and make it real to you. I'm going to look up how many thoughts do humans have per day. Oh, Lord. Approximately 60,000 thoughts in one day. 60,000 thoughts in one day. You think every one of them thoughts is a good thought and a godly thought and a wholesome thought? Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Man, I want to be thinking about the scriptures and not to be prideful or to boast, but guys, when I go places, that, that is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about my relationship with him. I'm thinking about where do I stand with him? I'm thinking about what am I, what am I doing with my life. Where God, what do you want me to say to this person that's in front of me? God, how do you want me to respond to this situation? God, what should I be doing? God, what are the things that you want for me in my future? Lord, Lord, and I am I am just always thinking about God. The scriptures come to my mind. I, I quote scriptures throughout the day when certain thoughts that one of these 60,000 thoughts, some of them you know that they're not even yours. Some of them you know that they're just evil. They're just evil thoughts and they're not even from you. And remember what Paul also said. Oh man, I could go in that direction, but I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stay the course. Um, these thoughts that I have, sometimes they're, they're evil and they're wrong. And what do I do? What do I have to do? I have to make them submit to this book. The things that are in this book. If I have a thought, let, let's just use the marriage example since it's here in uh, Romans chapter seven, where he says, you know, a man, when they're married to their wife, they should stay with them till death. And, and it, that's the law that they should be with them till death. Imagine you start having thoughts, well, it's not working out so good. That girl over there looks pretty attractive. I kind of into her. And you just your, your mind just goes there for a second. And then it's like, oh, no, no, no. You, you shut it down. You shut it down. But why do we shut it down? Because we know that it's wrong. Why do we know it's wrong? Because God's law is written on our hearts. And we shut it down because we know that it's wrong. But other people might not even shut it down. Because they've come to a place where that's just normal, just to think about that. And I know that maybe there is some people that hear this that, you, you lust after people and you don't even think that it's a problem. Oh, she's just a pretty girl. Oh, God made her. I can't just look at her and, and admire her. No, it's lust. That's called lust. You can't lust after people. You have to give your thoughts to Jesus and make them obedient. Take them captive. 
Flee youthful lust, the Bible says. To flee from all youthful lust. It's just to run away from them in the other direction. Submit it to Christ, guys. So get in this word. I'm glad you're here. This is a good start. And I know we're 45 minutes in, but guys, like, this is this this is gonna feed you. This is gonna feed your mind for the week so that you don't be stuck in the patterns of your mind that sin is waging war against and it's creeping in. Guys, sin creeps into your mind and it destroys your life, destroys it. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in areas of my life. Praise Jesus that it's still redeemable and he will redeem you. But in this life, guys, we, we, gotta, we gotta submit our thoughts to God. This power makes me a slave to the sin that's already within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So let's just, last little recap. And thing that I'll touch on is your identity and who you are in Christ. According to this scripture. That even when you do sin... The trap of the devil is to lie to you and to say, this is you. It's all you. This is who you are. And he starts to accuse you. The devil, the voice of the devil, it, the voice of the devil is an accusing voice. And he starts to label you. You're late. You're a slacker. You missed your homework. You're lazy. You looked at that girl. You're an adulterer. You did this. You, you are a thief. You stole that one time. You're thinking about stealing. You're a thief. That's just who you are. He just starts to accuse you. That's the voice of the devil. But what does Paul say? Paul separates himself from that. He says, nope, that's not me. That is another power that is living within me and I'm at war with it. You see how it's, it's coming after him. It's attacking him. But what is Paul? He says that it's at war with me. That if it's at war with him, that means that he's at war with it. Oh, or is he? Because it's already dead. Yes, he's at war with it. Because he's not going to allow sin to reign in his mind. He says, who will free me from this? Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin? Who will save my mind? The answer is in Christ Jesus. And guys, next Bible study, next one of these lessons, we're going to be going into Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, it talks about life in the Spirit. And this talks about how God transforms our thoughts and he changes the way we think. He changes our mind. But as I leave you off in this Bible study, here's what I want you to take away. Next time you have one of those evil thoughts, next time you have one of those thoughts that are wrong and you know they're wrong, understand that it is not who you are. If you are born again and you follow Jesus and you've given him your heart, you've been baptized, you just, you follow him. If you're his disciple, it's not who you are. You have been raised from death to life. And those dead thoughts and those dead works of sin, it's not your identity anymore. Your identity is a son of God. And now you're at war, waging war against the things that attack your carnal mind and attack your flesh. And that's the power of God that has brought you from death to life. And you are a son and you are forgiven. And God loves you, man. He's not condemning you. He's not pushing you away. He loves you. He loves you. He accepts you. He doesn't like your sinful thoughts, but he is the one who can actually give you the power to release you and save you from these evil thoughts. Look, who will save me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Verse 24. Thank God. Verse 25. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray to close us out. And I'm going to pray that this week, as you go forward, the rest of this week, wherever you're at, whenever you're watching this, that you go forward in the truth, knowing that your identity is not in sin anymore, but your identity is in Christ. So Lord, I lift you up. I give you thanks, God. I thank you for who we are. I thank you that we are sons and daughters according to what you have done for us on the cross. What a glorious hope that we have in you, Jesus. What a glorious hope that we have, that you would come down from heaven and humble yourself and take the wrath of God. You, you would take all the wrath and all the punishment for our sin and die for us on the cross. Lord, 
we choose right now in our minds to, to, to allow you. We just let you in right now, Holy Spirit. I ask you to just have your way. Whatever you want to do in these vessels, whatever you want to do in us, God, just do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Renew our minds, God. Renew our flesh. Give us rest, Lord, where we need rest so that we don't be thinking so lowly of ourselves, so that we don't be thinking so poorly of ourselves and so badly of ourselves, but that we live out, God, the calling of being a righteous person, the calling of being a, a righteous person according to the righteousness of God. God, that we belong to you because of what you have done for us. We thank you that we are sons. I prophesy over whoever is listening to this right now that you are a son of God, that you are a daughter of God, that you are not a sinful, evil person, but you are a son of God. And that identity of sin, it's another power living in you, that it is not you. It's something warring against you. And just because you have fallen and gotten hurt, you are going to get back up in Jesus' name. I say to you, rise, fallen child, and get up in Jesus' name. God, strengthen this person to rise in Jesus' name. Strengthen this person right now. Strengthen their weary legs. Strengthen their mind. Strengthen them, Lord God. I pray that you give them, their, th th give them your thoughts, Lord God, so that they can hear from you and live according to how you call them to live, Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you. And we pray for your anointing the rest of this week, the rest of our days, to live for you and to conquer sin by trusting in what you've done on the cross. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for renewing and restoring our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And God bless. I'm glad you guys listened to the podcast. Please make sure to uh, leave a like and um, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Um, and share the video because if you share the video, some other your friends are going to be able to hear the good news of the gospel. Some other your friends are going to be able to start to walk in freedom, just like you're going to start walking in freedom after watching this. So praise God. And uh, he loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you deeply. Um, yeah. And yeah, if, if you want to just support me so that I can keep, you know, doing what I'm doing, the best way that you can do it right now is just hit the like button and share and um, subscribe to the channel. And so that, you know, I can get more views and more people can see and uh, God can just do whatever he wants to do. So thanks for being here. God, thank you for being here. Thank you for working all of this, Lord, for your good. And we love you, Jesus. We praise you in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. I love y'all and I'll see you in the next one. In Jesus name. Amen.